from traditional medicine, alternative health practices, new innovations, and technology, which work together to help you look and feel natural and age gracefully. Now, here is your host, Dr. Lori Gerber. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, it is another stormy Wednesday night on the East Coast, so fingers crossed we hold uh, Wi-Fi and internet and all those good things. It has happened before. Um, but I'm really happy to finally get this show underway because it is all about stress management and stress and COVID reopening and all these things that honestly we're probably tired of talking about but really need to figure out. Um, so I'm really happy to have with us Dr. Richard Olberger. Um, he is, and actually I was reading his bio before um, we got on here, and it, he's from Rockville Center, New York, which I didn't realize, um, has his PhD in clinical psychology and has a podcast that is wonderful. I highly recommend you all go there. It's called Richard Listens. Super informative, um, just really well done and easy to listen to. So um, check that out on his uh, on all the podcast channels. Um, there is a link on his website too that I saw. And author of The Qualitative Kabbalah, um, which I will be getting. It's The Value of Living a Spiritual System. Um, that is on Amazon, right, Richard? It is. I right. look for, yeah, we'll tell you all about the new books coming out this year. Cool. Um, I'm going to give you a little blurb about him because I think this is really fun. He is known as Dr. Zero on Skid Row um, after working um, with the, as a psychologist in Beverly Hills with community leaders, LAPD, to save hundreds of lives on the brink of suicide, and then went into private practice. So um, now he's helping everybody um, focus on stress management, depression, um, athlete optimization, mental performance. So um, without further ado, and I do want to talk about your firsthand Arab-Israeli conflict uh, experience. I think it's super relevant right now. So I think that'll be. Oh, wow. Out, I'm right? glad you went there. I'm glad yes. you're going there. Thank you. I get, that means I get to. Sh yes, please do. We've got some sharing, right? It was, that's what makes this fun. It's super laid back and fun. But I encourage you guys to follow him. All of his stuff is Richard Listens on Facebook and Insta. Um, so I guess without further ado, kind of, I would love to talk about you for a few minutes, how you got into doing what you do, how you ended up from New York to California. Um, <laughs> all these good things so i'm gonna i know you're good at talking so i'm gonna i'm gonna not prep you too much and i'm just gonna let you talk about yourself and how you decided to do what you're doing oh man i love it when the shoe's on the other foot being a podcast host is so fun that minute you pass it off and you're like ah, <laughs> don't worry I'm out. pressure's on you <laughs> i have plenty of notes to fill in so go for it <laughs> that's great Lori. real pleasure to meet you and and a real honor to share this space and that you've created and the work that you do, and uh, I'm I'm really an admir ad I'm in admiration of uh, your work as a professional, uh, being a mom uh, through the pandemic, and all the pursuits of your own uh, athletic resilience. Uh, I just want to say thank you for all of that. Thank you. Yes, we're we're well. If you were athletes together, you guys will learn. So. <laughs> yes. So uh, right. Well, I could jump right in about uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, but. A little bit about me for your listeners uh, first, and, and yes, on Clubhouse, which is where I've been having a lot of these discussions about the Arab-Israeli conflict. I do host a men's tribe meeting every Wednesday on Clubhouse. I'm also at Doc Zero, so uh, check me out there. Um, where should we begin? If you want to know about how did I get in California? It's so funny because it's like somebody asked me about this just a week ago. And, and we think these experiences are nonsensical. Like it doesn't really make sense why I'm in Los Angeles. It may make a little bit more sense why I'm a psychologist, but you know, it's kind of like when they say like, you know, all roads lead to Rome or take the road less traveled. Uh, I had a, uh, I think probably I, I came to LA on my way to, I was about to move to Israel. So somewhere along the way between this journey for mental health and curiosity, both about the world people and the curiosity probably about myself and the way uh, my I was raised, the family birth order, seeing some, you know, instances of mental illness, really interesting people, but that weren't quite balanced, how that gets handled in a family, uh, and having some compassion for that and curiosity. My mom was also a guidance counselor. Uh, and uh, from my bio, you probably read, even though if people asked me until probably a few years ago, I would have said, well, my, my mom was a guidance counselor. Most of the women in my life were teachers and therapists. I think my father, who was a car salesman and a real estate uh, manager, probably had a lot more to do with my choice just from the way he was. 
uh, and unfortunately only really realizing that in, in his uh, in grieving him over the last two years, actually his, his anniversary will be t Monday, two years. Uh, so uh, rest in peace, we miss you, Jacob Olberger. And I think, you know, it was, he had a style of caring and listening. When my friends would come over the house and I used to just invite everybody, the whole basketball team, I didn't have any filters or boundaries. I'd be inviting, you know, plenty too many people and then not know what to do when they all showed up. But my parents kind of encouraged that social welcoming. They were always putting out food. And when someone would come over, my dad would open the door on a Friday night and sit down with them and, and ask them stories about their lives or what was going on with them. And he was really a genuine, caring listener. And so I just want to point that out there for some people who may be out there about, I don't know what my next position will be, or I don't know what I want to do. Maybe look at how you are or, you know, what, you know, what really, it, what makes you curious, what makes you feel connected. And so I really think I picked that up from him. You know, and to this day, I get a certain amount of, right, uh, passion when I feel connected to somebody else and what they're going through and a certain amount of intuition drives me in that way. And I think that's been there, you know, since the early years. That's so, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's tapping in. That's later. That's a few years of therapy myself. <laughs> I did not gain that trait. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm not a bad listener, but yeah, enjoyment, yeah, maybe, maybe lacking that. And to enjoy other people talking to you and helping them through it um, is such a gift, right? You have to be able to thoroughly listen, take it in. And it takes a lot of burden on yourself too, right? I mean, it's definitely a, especially if you're empathetic, it's, you're like a sponge. So that's a hard thing to do. Well, right. And as I'm sitting here, and you could probably treat me right now with, uh, you know, lower back inflammation, I guess it's called lower crossed syndrome, or apparently twisted mister, <laughs> or, if you're a, or if you're a female twisted sister, uh, right, you know, stress syndromes and the body, which I'm sure we're going to get into, are for real. So yes, listening to people taking on too much. Uh, especially during a pandemic, people having to take on roles uh blended roles it can become exhausting so knowing that limit and learning i learned carefully working on skid row in the county when you're immersed when you're surrounded with so much stress if there is not a self-care mechanism or language or discussion you have with yourself you could become quite toxic to you it's really i mean people were reflected to you in my case it was my you know, daughter, I think was probably, you know, four or five at the time. And I always tell people when people ask, what does her daddy do? She wrote, he works a day and at night and barely ever sleeps. And I didn't have to see another thing. Like that was like somebody, you know, a cross punch to my face of like, whoa, what's happened to me? You know, for all the right reasons, we get to this level of taking one more patient, doing one more thing to help out. And even sometimes it's training a little bit too hard as an athlete or, or not taking a day off. And we don't allow this other part in that's like, you need the care too. If I'm going to give to others or feel connected or even be open to what they need, there has to be a space where I feel grounded, connected, and like I'm healing and, and manifesting some sort of joy uh, or centeredness in my own life. So that's something that I've become increasingly aware about. Um, and curious about right uh, how and to get more of that. Daughter, to get that insight, <laughs> right you know if it's, it's things in life where you know or someone just like I, I had the same thing with my son you know i didn't want him to see me scared of the water hence triathlons and um because i got sucked out in a rip current years ago and never really wanted to go back in the ocean but you know when my son it looked at me he's like you're gonna go in the ocean mommy you know and then you're like no i i really don't want I'm to doing that was my impetus, right? It's like, okay, something's got to change. Like, this is not the way I want it to happen. So, well, there's something that's beautiful about that, right? In, in the, the parenting dynamic of realizing that we want to be different in, because we want to be different in our relationship to someone else. And, and children are so, right, they're not threatening us. We don't have to be defended. And I think, you know, there's something about fathers and daughters, right? And I have sons and I always thought, oh, well, I was scared. What would happen if I had a daughter? Because I have, it's the unknown. I still, to this day, a lot of times I have to step back. No, I have no idea. And I'm being told to step away. And it's really uncomfortable. And right. yet it's the best. 
because it's like I have to somebody you know my daughter is telling me as a growing human being trust me and and respect me and then you get to see if you give that <laughs> that there's a relationship can grow and I think that's a lot that's hard for a lot of men in relationship in general okay. right to, to to see how wait I have to do less right now I have to <laughs> you know step back I can be but do less yeah and it's not just men, but I know, I think men do have a harder time, but women want to fix, fix, fix too. So it's, that can be tough. So let's see, do you want to, do you want to dive into the conflict or do you want, let's, let's talk a little bit about COVID stress. Let's, let's go there and then I'll, I'll maybe I'll come back and, and uh, circle back. Cause I, I think we might go work down a little bit of a wormhole with the co- Arab conflict. So sure. Um, no problem. I, I have a couple of questions that actually were already coming in. So I, I wanted to start. Well, let's let's talk about the two. You said two new books, right? That you have coming out. Well, the 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 book that you mentioned, Qualitative Kabbalah, was part of my doctoral research. It's probably okay. now almost fourteen years ago, and I'm proud of it. And that it, it was I pushed to transfer to a school that integrated spirituality and mental health. And so I got a chance to look at how people, you know, uh, different religious practices across cultures. So this might be the the nice bow on any kind of interreligious conflict is that across people, across their different domains of practice, it, applying spiritual practice and how it can affect everything from perception of well-being to perceptions on health to social belongingness, things like that. And that was also, you know, it was something I was very curious about at the time and being curious about the world and curious about the Middle East and having gone there myself was that there was so much similarity and so much energy and and such you know such passion around being connected to your faith and connected to uh, practicing you know intensively. Uh, so it was interesting to put that into psycho- psychology and emotional language. So unfortunately, uh, rookie mistake for any of you out of grad school getting published. You know, if you give away a lot of the rights, they made it kind of a textbook. So. Uh, for a lot of your listeners, if it, it is it is on Amazon, but it is about seventy two dollars. So I think they wanted to keep it in the spiritual psychology realm. So the zero method coming out this year will be in your price point. It will be fifteen to twenty dollars, and you know we want it to be material that people can access and they can learn from if they are not able to get in to see us as practitioners, or if you're in the middle of uh, the country or the Middle East and you can't make it into a session. I want people to have access and not be limited by cost. And I, I love the name. The zero method is great because, you know, that's that's your roots, man. You can't forget those because that's not going anywhere. Well, I love, I, yeah, and I love that story. I love, you know, that I was on Skid Row. I mean, not that anybody probably wants to wind up on Skid Row. And I don't know if other parts of the country call their downtown with a large homeless population Skid Row. But in Los Angeles, it's one of the, uh, I think, top three in the nation per capita amount of homelessness and drug use. And it's right sandwiched like a few blocks away where tremendous gentrification is happening. So at a few blocks from Staples Center where the Lakers play. And, and yet it's both this powerful area where there's um, more missions per capita. So there's all these places trying to give physical health, feeding, all these caring professionals there. And this tremendous effort to integrate that care so that people can get access to training, jobs, pursuit of art or thing and at the same time provide substance abuse recovery so it's a fascinating place and yet even in my own career as a professional I was kind of summarily sent down there Um, and so the experience of being somebody who's kind of in shock going into the environment you know it's hard to picture this when you're walking over tents you're walking over people when you go into work down there we're literally working out of a trailer and the only thing you give you you get about 15 minutes for a session. Sometimes you get a corner of a room, sometimes a staircase, sometimes an area by a dumpster. And the only thing you give them for their next session they get from you is what looks like a crumbled up post-it note. <laughs> and on it is a, is a blank space where you can put the na- your name, the date, and a time. So if you can scribble that kind of on your hand. So obviously my last name is too long. So often I would put Dr. O, you know, 524, 4 p.m. And then the the homeless individual takes this paper, crumbles it in their pocket, hopefully doesn't forget it. And when they come in to the clinic, they hand it under like a ticket window. Somebody opens it and reads it aloud like it's bingo. So it was just, it was a funny moment one day when my coworkers, I were sitting around and somebody called out, paging Dr. Zero, Dr. Zero to the front desk. 
and uh, you know, he was kind of a cartoonist. One of my my partner social workers, he said, you know, that's that's your new name. That's your Doctor Zero, you know. And I, I think that you know, having this kind of you know kind of superhero idea, but I think it it is it it to me it resonates because it's like I want to be able to know within myself that I can go and give care. It really does not matter the degrees. I didn't even consciously welcome that choice at the time. But I think embracing the opportunity presented that there are people who need your help. And sometimes just by being present, whether it be 15 minutes, I mean, the, the appreciation and the gratitude uh, and the amount of impact we were able to have and, and the impact I was able to see that clients gave one another by providing safe, supportive groups, profound. I saw a lot of healing and treatment take place in one of the more difficult environments in the country. That's amazing. That's, I mean, and actually, that, I'm glad I heard that story. I had a totally different skin on, <laughs> which I won't share. But I, not bad. I just too long winded. But um, that's that's a great way to put it, Doctor Zero. I love it. And to me, I mean, it to me, it was just like you're working at baseline, like you're working at ground zero, and that's kind of how I interpreted it. Um, but I love that because it's. Well, you are tapping into the book. The principle of the book will be that kind of going from the levels, like starting what would level three awareness to level two, one and like zero being, being the highest level of where we want to get to maybe being present in your life. So in relationship to yourself, in relationship to getting through maybe different things that we're struggling with, that is kind of what the, the zero method will be with, with okay. steps and stages and with some tools and techniques to make it practical. That's great. Um, so I'll look for that and I'll get it. Let me know when it's out. And so let's talk a little bit about COVID because I actually just had a, not an altercation, but a little disagreement with a patient today about the reopening process and, and, and how it's moving along. And I think one of the biggest things to note, and I think we can go two directions with this. There's so many people that are very happy about COVID opening, right? Um, everything's going back to normal. And then there's people that have extreme anxiety, depression over reopening, right? Because they, they, maybe they got comfortable. There's lots of reasons why. Um, and it doesn't really make sense, right? Because the depression, domestic abuse, alcohol abuse, everything's gone up, right? Exponentially, but people are still so scared of reopening where that should all get back to normal, right? It should get better. You would think that depression is going to get better. Anxiety is going to get better. All these things are going to go down. And but it's really not the case, is it? So I'm kind of curious how it's changed. Well, I know how COVID changed your practice is probably a big topic, but what are people saying to you? What are the big kind of flag words that you're hearing when you are talking to people? Wow. You said so much right there. I got like so <laughs> much visualization of like my last three days. I was like, I was living what you were just saying. And that's the hardest thing I think about this last year is that we as practitioners are going through it at the same time. We're having the same experience. We're having someone burst in our room, uh, you know, when we're in a session, we're also parents from home. My, my practice right now is 100% virtual. Okay. Uh, I think I mentioned I did more podcasts during the pandemic uh, than I had in the five years prior. Uh, so the expansive use of technology uh, and the use of technology and mental health has been uh, even with mediums such as uh, Clubhouse and being able to reach people worldwide and different individuals are in different stages of the pandemic. You speak to individuals in Canada and Britain right now, and I think they're both in a lockdown. So that it, it's that's kind of useful in that it gives you a perspective maybe you are at a place of like, wait, hey, I'm living in Florida or I'm in California right now and things are kind of seeming open and Memorial Day weekend's coming, but it gives you perspective of somebody else who says, well, I'm just living here and I'm struggling my relationship and all we see all day is one another. Uh, so I do think in general, you know, I, I didn't want to get like too heady for your listeners, but in clinical terms, I do think anytime you have a sudden shock, I mean, it's as if some of the conversations I have with my clients is like, you know, if it is not post-traumatic stress, some form of disassociation, which is the opposite, like the work you do is what we call association, meaning I'm here to connect my body. I'm here to integrate my mind, my thoughts, and my body. Does my, do I have inflammation? Do I have a rash? Do I have stress showing up in my body? You know, is my diet affecting it? Is my relationship? What, what can I do mind-body balance? 
So, but when there's a shock and something happens out of your control, we develop all these coping skills, like you mentioned. Some of them feel good because it's like, okay, well, I bunkered down and I just drank more and I didn't really have to go to work or I didn't have to face other stressors. So we get into a mode of survival coping. And then when we're faced with this, it's, it's another stressor, right? Things are reopening, which is supposed to feel good, but it can also bring about overwhelm. Right. So I think that's what a lot of clients are, are, are speaking about is going through, right? And, and even small discussions can be awkward. Like somebody I met this morning, it was like, can I shake your hand? And I was like, <laughs> I, 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 then I realized I, I didn't react probably in the way I wanted to. And then I'm like, oh no, did I just offend them? So it can, it can be a joining moment. It can be something we laugh around about uh, a discussion. And I think once we get through this initial moment of like, <laughs> Yeah, verbally exchanging vaccine cards or what we need to do to feel safe in a forum or safe about a get together. It can feel really good uh, to feel connected again. But I do think that it is really hard to what I, this is what trauma renegotiation is about, is about, wait a minute, I went to Disney World. This should be Disneyland. I feel, this should feel great. But I, I felt really like scared at times. I felt threatened. And to be able to integrate that it's still not, even because it, it should feel good and you want it to feel good, doesn't mean that it's still not awkward. And we kind of need a little bit of patience and slowing down these moments to figure out what is okay for us right now and what are we still uncomfortable with? And where do we need to set more boundaries and terms in our relationships and, and where we're just not ready yet? And is that okay to say to someone, hey, I really want to see you, but I'm, I may, you know, I'm just not there yet can we touch base in a few weeks <laughs> can I, I own I that get, the question is is and actually this is the first question that I got so I'm glad you brought up the social anxiety hmm. part of it because on Facebook I got a question that said um well it, it went are there any practices I can do at home to relieve my new social anxiety um and in my brain I'm like are there any cognitive and I know how you are with cognitive therapies is there any cognitive therapy she can do before she goes out before you know while she's at home to prepare yourself before, let's just say, before you go back to work in person, right? Or before you have to go to that mall again and maybe look silly because you have the mask on, even though the mask mandate is lifted and you're, you're, you're you know, you're feeling anxious over that or, or the opposite, right? Your mask is off and you're worried about getting COVID. And what can someone do? Like, what do you like to say to that patient preventatively? That's, That's a great thing. question. I mean, the first thing I thought was like, well, you're saying, what can you do internally at home to deal with social, right? Yeah. There's a paradox there, yeah. right? And yeah, we can prepare and we can have a plan, but in some ways being social is now new again. And so I think the, the preparation part is thinking about, and, and this depends, right? Are you living individually? Are you, are you single? Are you in a relationship? Do you have kids? So it's different. For each group, I think so, you know, for myself, it, it, most calls I got from couples were about differences in perception around one wanted to be more out there and one didn't. So now I think it's about getting on that same page. Are you ready? Having a conversation to your other uh, to go to sporting events? Are you ready to start going to parties? Are we ready to start having people over? If so, um, you know, if we both are emotionally in the same place around you know, emotionally, why do you want it to happen? And then health-wise, what do you need to have happen to make that feel okay? Uh, so I think it depends on the people in your life. You know, is it somebody else who you're trying to protect and has a health concern that you're still concerned about and want to be cautious around? Um, can you invite over, you know, for us, we've learned to feel safe having one person over at a time or one couple and, and having that conversation, it seems awkward, but you know, hey, we're vaccinated, are you vaccinated? Okay, it like eliminates a little bit of, if that if that's what matters to you. Mm -hmm. um, for, for my children, they go to a school, they signed an agreement that said they would not do any kind of at-risk gatherings or the whole school could wind up being, you know, like, like they feel a great responsibility around that. So for them, they are the strictest ones in our house. They want to make sure if we go somewhere. So I feel a degree of responsibility to them in making choices that would make them feel safe. So that's my accountability. Maybe other parents don't feel that level uh, of accountability and they want to feel good in the moment. 
and I want to respect that position too. But I think to answer your question, it's having a plan. If I if I really want to, if I'm still with keeping the mask on, and that's where I want to be when I go out, then being honest to yourself is really important. And you may need to talk about it when you get home. If you got some looks, or somebody gave you a a weird kind of gaslighting, which happens like, oh, you're still afraid. I mean, all these weird things. I don't know if getting into conflict with someone in the moment helps because I'm not really sure that everybody realizes where they're coming from. They may think it's about the mask, but I think there's so much out of control disassociation, like I started to mention, which is kind of a trauma symptom of too much, too quick, and not really knowing where you stand. So sometimes we make this quick band-aid decision. That's it. No more mask. I can't take it. Going out every yeah. Yeah. And and, and at risk behaviors, right? I'm gonna that's it. We're like everyone's like tired of being cooped up to single people. I'm gonna go and maybe push my level of you know intimacy to a level of riskiness that I was not even at before. Or, you know, so I think really trying to slow down inside yourself and asking yourself what you want and need socially or plan. Uh, you know, I'm trying to take it right now, like a few a month at a time. Maybe you're going to feel differently in, in a few months. Um, maybe this, the landscape and where you live will feel like everyone's vaccinated. And the, the I mean, it's very, it's really confusing here in California. The, there's certain rules nationwide, then there's different rules when you go into places. Yeah. So it does take this kind of little bit of a dis discussion. Oh, okay. Like I'm going to that restaurant. I'm going to bring my mask because that's what makes people and the owners and respects the workers there. You know, personally, when I leave there, you know, I, I don't feel I need the mask because I feel good and I want to enjoy smiling at faces. Like, I want to get clear on my decisions, you know, connecting my behavior rather than being kind of a reactive, um, you know, thing. I, I, I personally want to make sure that people around me feel good and safe. And um, So this is the new marital counseling discussion, right? I think so. I, I was amazed. More calls during the pandemic. And, and th then it enters the family therapy dynamic too. And so I guess if your couple's communication was is in line, this just becomes now the, the primary discussion that you have. And I think it's, it's exciting in a way, because if you are gonna be brave enough to go to Disneyland or go back to the movie theater, it's like, well, what do you feel comfortable with, right? And, and, and making someone feel safe and secure and healthy is, is a part of every relationship. And you may feel triggered. Like it's gonna be hard if you see someone who's not following practices in the same way you are. Um, are you okay with getting hugs? Are you all right? I mean, I was telling someone when my clients are like, I, sh I shook hands with someone for the first time in six months uh, this weekend. And he was, uh, you know, uh, vaccinated, you know, older gentleman who reached out his hand to introduce me and to me, the level of respect <laughs> that it meant to shake that hand, like was something very, it just meant something way more. Yeah. Did I throw aside my safety protocol? You know, I, I, I don't know, but it felt okay. Like I had to kind of have that experience with myself to go, I'm ready for that. Um, am I ready to give hugs? Am I okay with that? If it's, you're right, if I know people are vaccinated, uh, and, and then if you're dating, right, am I, am I attempt, am I okay with, with physical contact? I do think it's okay to be like really young and, 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 and curious inside about where you're at with these things. And that doesn't mean, it, and that can cause anxiety, but not all anxiety is unhealthy because you're questioning something that you used to have a level of comfort with. And now it's a new experience, right? And I also think we're talking about anxiety and depression so much more i mean it's it's a lot the dialogue is much more open right so people are much more prone to admit even the anxiety right or wrong they're much more prone to admit that feeling as opposed to before COVID. i don't know if you agree with me but i think you know even in the media social you name it i mean i feel anyone that has or had i should say any kind of anxiety or depression prior to COVID, i would presume it feels a lot more accepting in the current environment and then opening back up again, I think the same fear maybe comes back in too. Like, Oh no, is it not going to be as accepted? Is it not going to be as talked about because everybody's not in that same boat anymore? Um, right. That's the beauty of slowing down. Like you yeah. said that. So I identify when you say like, Hey, I'm kind of like, like, I think 
I was enjoying slowing down. Like slowing down meant things to me. It meant that I asked myself questions. I made choices. I chose directions that I probably wouldn't have done if it wasn't forced upon me, which is by the way, why sometimes the rates of compliance when people are in mandated therapy, their success rates are actually higher than when people choose it. So, you know, there's something about, right, when you have to make a choice, but now that you've got to this level of slowing down, talking about emotional health, talking about anxiety, learning practices to, you know, take care of yourself when you weren't working and running 24 seven, uh, figuring out what really values to you, the value of, of human life. Uh, you know, I think these things were, were gifts and now and we even were talking about, right, anniversary of George Floyd this week, right, racial inclusion, diversity, equity, so many discussions start to happen. Now the pressure becomes when you have more choices, when the world is open, when you're excited, it comes from excitement. I wanted to do these things that I haven't been able to. What happens to your kid when you give them too much? <laughs> I want to go on every ride at Disneyland. <laughs> I, I want to stay up, but I don't want to go to sleep, right? So I think it's really hard then to navigate this like intense deprivation and newness with overwhelm, right? Too much of a good thing can become a stressor too. So that's where the skills that I think we really offer in therapy and which I hope your, your clients also get from you from coming in and connecting to a practitioner and addressing their health regularly, doing things to make sure, right? What, how is, how is your nutrition? What are you doing for your self-care? What are you doing to heal if you have an injury? How are you dealing with the inner athlete, your mindset? Um, you know, right? Are you enjoying what you're doing? Are you enjoying it, or does it just feel like another performance, another job? Uh, are Are you having Are you having that relationship to yourself, or are you doing this because you're trying to fulfill something um, that's never enough? Right? It's never right. enough. It's never enough championships. Never enough medals. It's never enough weight loss. It's never enough muscle strength. Right? That that it's never enough money. So right to turn off that incessant messaging. We need to slow down. So I'm hoping that this is like we keep helping. Yeah, we, like, we keep the slow down with the excitement. Like it's this internal balance that nobody can decide for you. Um, you know where I know that they have that commercial for an antidepressant where they're like asking a girl to come out and she's like, no, she lies and she stays home. It's a commercial for an antidepressant. So. Yeah, I get it. Like, we don't want to say no to all social interaction, but it's okay if it feels too much and you want to take baby steps and you're not ready for something yeah, that I'm, you used to love. Yeah. I mean, because it's, it's and, and someone texted, they said, you know, we were talking about staying home and the introverts love this, right? I mean, oh, yeah. all extroverts, we, we became okay with being slightly introverted, right? Like you said, okay, it's okay to slow down our type A personality. We just pulled it back. I will tell you, probably I saw more cortisols drop than raise during COVID, despite the anxiety and everything else. I mean, you know, you're not, they're not in the office. They don't have that stress or the added interaction. Women don't have to put on heels, dress up, be judged. There's, there's so many different things that go into that. But the person that just asked, it says, how do I keep my confidence back while I go back in person to the workplace? I was more confident on Zoom. And I think that's interesting. really interesting because that person is probably an introvert, doesn't like necessarily being in front of people and feels with the screen there that they can maybe express themselves better than maybe even being in person. And you know, that's a really interesting question. That's a great question. So I would say write down what, what strengths, like you, you asked earlier about me, what gifts came out for you? in regards to your work, your relationship to work during COVID, right? Because those gifts are yours, you notice them. And, you know, a lot of my clients, we had talk about, well, they get in a meeting maybe and the boss calls to them or they're not ready and they get overwhelmed, they clam up, right? So, uh, you know, the same, the work was the same. Like, so maybe Zoom became, I can hide out easier. I don't have to face that challenge. Mm -hmm. So I would ask you while you're identifying your gifts, right? So what new challenges do I perceive? Because if we're going to name a challenge and see it happening, we kind of take away its power. We kind of, or we know, right? Tony Robbins wakes up in the morning, names the six biggest things facing him as challenges. Because it's like, if I name it, then I know what I'm battling. It's, I, it's not going to linger as anxiety throughout my day, right? I'm not afraid of it happening. And then, you know, look at what might I need, 
more of to face that challenge? So is it right boundary setting? Is it now that you're back in the workplace, people stop by your desk or ask you to do too many things or don't set clear work hours? Like what about being back in the workplace is challenging? Is it perceptions around uh, having to get dressed up, right? Maybe, maybe your workplace has shifted um, to have modifications to some work from home. Maybe they've modified uh, the culture in terms of relaxed dress versus. So I, I would make a, you know, a lot of requests and ask for a lot of information because I'm not sure that every company is even clear. Mm -hmm. And I do think some are, are shifting outright uh, to accommodate a lot more. If it works for you and your company will go for your proposal to, to split your time or whatever, they know you're going to be efficient, a team player. Um, but, you know, keep looking at what you want to gain if you, by the challenge, right? What What is it that I might need? So is it that I need more support at the workplace? Is it that I need a little bit more boundaries? Uh, is it that I might need more mentoring? And I think those are things we don't always ask ourselves um, is, is what our needs are and what we might, might need more of to succeed. So it is an opportunity in that like you're going back, but you're going back with a new awareness. You're I'm different. I'm even hoping if it's the, the same job. See that, right? That's my hope. I mean, I know we've, we've changed certain things in our practice and um, I mean, you've become all virtual. I mean, that's a, a dramatic change. And, and I have to say, I, I think in being in the cosmetic end of things as well, um, one of the biggest things that I hear in general is, the freedom to not feel like you have to put on heels, get dressed up, dye your hair every single day. And, you know, I guess it has its pros and cons in my head, right? There's some, there's some benefits and some, and some not benefits for me in general, but to feel comfortable in your own skin, because that's who you are and not feel like you have to prove it to these social norms, I think was really empowering for a lot of women. And may have created conflict in marriages, who knows, but, you know, or, uh, you know, created Zoom anxiety because, you know, you're only dressing from the waist up. But I encourage people to talk to their employers about what the new protocols and new norms are, because there are so many things that have been brought out that are positive. I love that you say make a list of kind of what this has given you, because I think, I think, I mean, my son, for example, was home. Mom at home, my husband actually started traveling internationally three months at a time. And I decided because I couldn't be back and forth in school and out of school, I decided that I was going to keep him home and do a private in, in, at home program. In theory, that sounded wonderful. In reality, <laughs> I found that my son had a disability and was never caught in the public school system. And my son's in the gifted program and would never have flown under the radar for years. But because of this gift of being home, and whether the hours of fighting at night were a gift, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but I was able to see that, oh my goodness, he can't, like he legitimately couldn't retain information to write it on paper. And his working memory was very, very low. Well, his IQ and his visual spatial and his math, super high. But the kid is very, very, I joke, he's Elon Musk, right? He's very right on the, uh, on the spectrum and he's super black and white and has very low working memory. So when I finally got him tested, I realized, oh my goodness, at some point in junior high, high school, you would have had major problems here. Is it, I mean, it would take him hours to write three sentences. So there are certain things that I really, I mean, I'm, I think people overlook the positives. And I think a lot of people, rather than being anxious over health and COVID, it's how do I keep the positives that I gained? and bring them into this new life because that is really difficult, that balance. And that's, I encourage people, get your blood work done. Let's get your hormones, your cortisol, your inflammation in check. Let's keep your brain and from a physical perspective well, right? Because right now you're, a lot of people are at the lowest stress level they've been in a long time. Some people are higher. There's definitely the two extremes. And bring that forward and say, okay, what can we do to maintain that? Meditation, adaptogens, you know, there's different things that I do. And from your perspective, how often do you suggest someone talk to you? Like, is it weekly? Is it you know, it, obviously I want to be sensitive to the whole person. Sometimes if it's intense and we're making change, which I'm starting to make a big break from a relationship or really needs intensive, then it's weekly. Okay. Um, you know, some people are coming in with, with trauma and they, they 
that they need to take a break from work because they've worked through the pandemic. Yeah, so that's a whole different. Uh, they, yeah, they need more intensive, but usually it's weekly or, or every other week for maintenance because we want to get away from just content, catching up on details to getting into a process and, and looking at why we respond the ways we do and shifting that story um, and creating a new story. And that takes getting into the narratives and reprocessing. And we have to do that in the session. We got to see how it comes up so that you can practice that outside. Um, so, yeah, and a lot of the work, if someone said to me, well, the other every other week when they're not seeing me, they're doing something for self-care or they're working with a functional medicine doctor or they're doing a stress, uh, a yoga class with their partner, right? Like I'm going to be in favor of more space for self-care if you're, a high stress professional, whether someone is a parent who's, you know, managing a job and kids and a home and family relationships. I mean, or they're an athlete, they're still, or they're a lawyer, there's still increasing demands, the phones, the social media, it's not ending at five o'clock. And this language of even learning to figure out what a boundary is or where is space for yourself seems to have gotten overridden in favor of, right? creating more uh you know it's more about the future it's right. more about right i want to be more i want to have more i want to be sexier stronger right wealthier and and so a lot of things get lost in that moment so if i can reinforce a whole picture of that uh so i don't know if it, but in times you know weekly is what is needed okay. Because I mean, it would be it's obviously our synergy would it works really well together just medically and again, I'm, I'm definitely not a therapist. I, I, you know, I'm like a bartender. I do, I hear everything and I listen to everything. I don't know that I always have the right answers, but, um, you know, when your time as a medical practitioner is limited, yeah. you know, and, and you're there to treat something specific or focus on, you know, and so having a team, if you can, if you can find a way to create your team and for some people it's their, their trainer at their gym, you know, but finding some way to integrate the various aspects of your health and a lot of men, tend to overlook their physical health, looking at their blood work, checking out the relationship to the foods they're eating and maybe their thyroid level, doing yeah. that yearly physical. So I think now that we're given the all clear and you're not afraid of an existential threat, that getting back to doing the, the maintenance of health is the first order of business. That's, it's funny you say that because that was on my kind of last, I told you I took some notes for, for filler, but um, that was one of my last kind of miscellaneous fears, I think. And I find that a lot of people are, yes, obviously there's the vaccine fears. There's the fears of getting your kids vaccinated at, at the risk of talking about that. I don't even know that I want to go there, but um, there's fears about getting back on your routine maintenance. Um, you know, I've let it go two years and I hear this a lot that I'm overdue and I'm scared of what I'm going to find. Right. My mom had breast cancer. My mom had, so that's something that I like to reiterate. And, and by the same token, it's been so hard to get mental health because you know, everybody's getting mental health right now um, via Zoom or Skype that people are scared of, of not being able to get back to normal. And it's, oh, it's too hard at this point. I'm just going to let it go. Right. From both perspectives, yours and mine. Um, and I think that's really important that people understand that this is, you know, this is a process and it's not what you don't know won't hurt you, right? We need to kind of figure it out in one way or another. Um, it is really true. I mean, I'm hearing that a lot of clinicians are full, they're burnt out, they've been isolated. So we want to make sure that we're, you know, like, how do we create more mental health amongst our families, our friends? How do we kind of keep doing this work? to make it safer for people to not be okay, right? Is it okay that somebody says, I'm depressed, I went out, I don't even know why I'm depressed. Some guy asked me to shake his hand and I was like, gave him a fist bump and then he looked at me weird and I was wearing a mask. I mean, these are all the things that everybody is going through, right? And this one, you know, they, this one was posting about politics six months ago and I'm not sure I agree with their views. Like, how do we kind of let go of some of the stories and just get back to connecting and caring? and drop some of the defenses that came up and accepting, right? Can you accept, right, um, you know, that, that people have different feelings and yet still create more of a space for acceptance yeah. and allowance to be different? So I really, um, I know you have to go soon too. I'm gonna let you go in a few minutes, but you have a little line on your website and on some of your stuff that says, you talk about how people can become heroes in their own lives. Is there anything that 
you can bring that to be relevant for COVID? Like, how can you be a hero in your own life in the current environment of going back into a post COVID world? Is there something that you see? And I, I mean, I kind of have my own interpretation of what you wrote, but I'm mm-hmm. kind of curious how, what that means to you with what you do. Well, in general, I think being a hero in your life is kind of what we're talking about. It's owning the fears, owning the anxieties and being able to go out and battle them and, and ask yourself, what story do I want to tell? What's, do I want to be telling a resilient story? Do I want to be telling a story of health about discovery right now? Uh, newness, a discovery of health, of new communication and relationships, of a new side to me. Maybe I am transforming my work, my passion, my interests. Uh, so am I willing to adapt that? And am I willing to own that, that this is my hero's journey? And however I got here, it's okay to embrace myself with all the fears and all the anxieties and all the emotions that get triggered by it, that it is wonderful. And I'm allowed to be curious and and, and whether you're working with someone to help carve that story or getting support from any way or direction that will help foster your growth. um, Can I allow this story to be growing and and be written right now? As far as it ties into post COVID, uh, yeah, I think some of it is, right? If you feel comfortable, if you feel really strong, um, if you feel really passionate, somebody or some practice is making you feel invalid or not safe or secure, you can trust your intuition. And that that's okay. That's winning. That's not failing if you had to go home. It is not failing if you tell your boss too many days a week in person is too much. And it's not failing if you don't feel like getting full dressed up to the nines because you've discovered it doesn't have the same meaning anymore. So I think allowing yourself this journey, this permission to discover what you need and write it down, put it down. Can you bring that into where do you need a little bit more? Do you need a little bit more space and boundary in your relationship? Do you need more exploration to go out and see girlfriends because you've been stuck at home <laughs> dealing with a son and work and seeing patients? Or yet, like, what do you need more of? What are you noticing? Because every time you take a step and ask for your own needs to be met, you actually care for everybody else in your life. It's the paradox. We get so busy caring for everyone else or wondering what the world is doing and we forget about ourselves. So, um, you know, this is not about being selfish. It's about self-care and mental health and allowing yourself to be present in every moment. And all of you with all the anxieties and, and all the struggles. And it's beautiful. It's, yeah, it there's is nothing good. wrong with you for having all that. So I think I got like a minute and a half with you before you got a roll. So I'm going to ask you about your experiences in um, Israel, and sure, give me the give me the brief lowdown just so I can see how it shaped you. And this is Doctor Zero giving us how he was formed, right? So sure. Well, I've got I've got you know a handful of minutes if you if you need them, but. Um, You know, going and living in the Middle East and studying abroad changed my life. It was a time when my family had lost their money. Uh, I don't even know, like I had been working three jobs for college. So if anyone can study abroad and find a way to go explore the world, I think it gives you something. And I happen to be fortunate enough to go live and live in like a trailer in Beersheba, Israel, which Ethiopian and Russian immigrant community at the time. I got to work with children who lost parents to drugs and war. So that experience helped shape me. And that curiosity about the world and meeting with uh, religious Jews and meeting with Arabs in East Jerusalem and Muslims and getting to explore the differences gave me tremendous passion. So if you can get curious, if you can meet people at a human level and get beyond the politics and get beyond the pain and sit down and have engagement with others. I think that's the best gift we can do for each other and for the world right now. Um, I know there are these discussions happening on on Clubhouse. I've been a part of them. Uh, and I think it's really, really hard if you're if you're living far away. I know we're we know each other from Maccabi International. If you are passionate and pro the one you know country or one religion because it's given so much to you, it's really hard not to invalidate the other perspective and say, well, if mine is good, the other must be bad. And I just, you know, I both want to, you know, say that my, my thoughts and prayers go out to anyone who's experiencing any kind of suffering, uh, you know, who experiences violence, 
who's experienced a lack of safety, who doesn't have the ability to work or take care of themselves uh, or feel like they're part of a, a country where they cannot experience that. My, my, you know, my pain and my heart goes out. And the one conversation we've been having at home and my kids are fortunate enough to have an expert speak to them and show them the map and show that we're talking about seven kilometers of space and how tiny it is yeah. and how hard it is to let go when something is physically so close and emotionally so close to you and your whole definition of your history and your people. Um, so we understand what the problem is. We don't know the way forward, but I really hope that it starts with sitting down together and experiencing sameness, experiencing uh, humanness and, and continuing that dialogue. Um, and, uh, you know, if it keeps recurring, right, as we tell people in mental health or in your physical health, right, there's a message there. There's a message for us that we haven't gotten yet. And, um, you know, I certainly hope there's a way for every child who comes into this world to feel like they are safe and can create their own future without having to feel opposed to another people regardless of race, religion, or creed. So we kind of got our taste of it this kind in our country this last year. And I hope that that continues, you know, globally. Um, and I'm sure you're noticing it in how it affects your clients and their stress levels. It's, it's deeply personal and deeply moving. It's really hard to focus on anything else when there's, when there's conflict going on, um, you know, in it the Middle is. East. And that's, that was perfectly summed up. I loved it. So <laughs> how can someone schedule an appointment? We have about two minutes. How can someone schedule sure. an appointment with you? Website is richardlistens.com. There's a contact me link on there. Get a free uh, 15 minute. I think you can schedule consultation with me at any point in time. Uh, you can DM me on Instagram uh, and 424-209-7234. You need to reach out to me. Um, so <laughs> we'll put, we will put this, this video, um, this is recorded. So you guys, this will be on um, my YouTube channel, which is Anti-Aging Unravel. Dr. Um, Olberger will have it for his, um, whatever he wants to put it up on. And it will also be on obviously Voice America on their channel, on Voice America on the wellness. It'll be recorded on there for you guys. Um, and I just want to quick do a, a little summary um, of, of just the type of people that I feel like are, have been reaching out. And, and if this applies to you, you know, I just encourage, you know, don't just sit there and, and do nothing again. You know, we talked about physical health and trying to put that off, but mental health right now, um, I'm struggling finding my own people for my son, um, you know, substance abuse, um, people that feel like they have social anxieties, um, or extreme introversion that have a lot of anxiety going back out. Um, and like I said, the body image concerns, um, even new sobriety, you know, a lot of people got sober during COVID. So with, with these new found, um, maybe gifts, we need to learn how to cherish them and deal with the feelings that go with it. So, um, on that note, you can also reach out to me at, um, my Dr. .com, M Y D R L O R I. And, um, you can also go to info at my Dr. .com and email me. I do Facebook. I do Insta. Oh, what else do I do? Like I said, YouTube, whatever you get on, it'll all come to me. I'm a one man show these days. So, um, I hope to have Dr. Olberger back. You guys message me if you liked it and uh, we'll bring him back on and we have tons to talk about because he's I great. think we could do a show on each one of those topics. Yeah. It's amazing. Yes. If you're out there, if you, any of those topics, if you want to be directed, if you are coming out of substance abuse, right. you need more support. Don't be afraid to ask, uh, and we will at least get you connected to resources and Perfect. someone can help near you. Well, we're going to sign off for the night guys. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for listening to anti-aging unraveled. Thank you so much.